is all about the history of the universe. Who knows what the universe is? So for those online, are you, the universe is a very big, big place where planets are in. So are we in the universe right now? Yeah. That's right. So everything around us is in the universe. Everything that we can see is in the universe. Yes, stars live in the universe. Planets live in the universe. Everything, everything that we know lives. This chair lives in the universe. This hand that's up right here, that lives in the universe. Everything we know, everything we think about lives in the universe. All right. What about the next thing? The universe from the Big Bang. What's the Big Bang? When space was formed. Oh, so when space was formed, I like that. So we're thinking about something expanding very, very fast. The universe expanding very, very fast. These are all excellent ideas and things that I'll be talking about today. Now the title says the universe from the Big Bang to today. But when I was writing this talk, I realized that's way too long. So just from the Big Bang to later is the new title of the talk. Just a little bit later maybe. But before we get even into the talk and into all of this amazing content, I want to ask you all a question. I'm an astrophysicist, but who knows what an astrophysicist is? I'm going to the back of the room over here. What is an astrophysicist? Or who is an astrophysicist? Someone who studies space. Awesome. So someone who studies space. Yes. Okay. So what else? What else? Yes, right here. An astrophysicist is an astrophysicist. Is that how you say it? Wow, that's a bit of a tautology. Uh, a physicist would call that a tautology when you, when you define something with the same thing that it is. But an astrophysicist is someone who studies space. I really like that answer. Oh, you're an astrophysicist. My, my friendly space studier. Who can be an astrophysicist? Right here. Anyone who wants to be an astrophysicist. Excellent, excellent answer. I think that's perfect. Okay. Anyone who is curious about the universe. And this is a group of astronomers, astrophysicists that I work with at Mount Stromlo. You can see we're a very diverse bunch. We even have some people with pink beards. So if you have a pink beard, you can come and be an astronomer and astrophysicist as well. All you have to do, all you have to be is curious about the universe. Okay, cool. Where am I? I wasn't there. I wasn't present that day. That's actually quite an old photo. Okay, so today we're going to be two different types of astrophysicists. So in the world of astrophysics, there are observers and there are theoreticians or theoretical astrophysicists. So we're talking about the Big Bang. We had some very excellent ideas of what the Big Bang was. We understood what the universe was and everything in it. That's us. And this story kind of starts with this guy down here. When we're trying to... Albert Einstein. Thanks very much. Albert Einstein. So Albert Einstein. So Albert had a very interesting idea. And this idea is best expressed in some mathematics. So I told you today we're going to be playing in the theoretical world. And that means looking at the universe as a set of mathematical expressions. So this is the mathematical expression that Einstein come up, came up with after working for 10 years on this as well. This was like a 10 year job. What this really says is that the geometry of the universe, so how the universe is shaped, the wibbles and the wobbles of the universe, is kind of equal to the total amount of momentum and energy in the universe. But we can even simplify this more. The curvature of space-time, so how the universe is shaped on the larger scales, the curves of space-time, is equal to the stuff in the universe. Okay, so this was Einstein's great idea. And this kind of rocked the world in 1915. So it kind of looks like this. So when you chuck stuff in the universe, the universe bends around that stuff. So the amount of stuff there will tell the universe how much to bend. Okay, so, so this kind of was, was groundbreaking at the time. Have people seen these kind of things before? No, no? ooh, yeah? Awesome. Trampolines, beautiful. So. So probably when you're sitting on top of a trampoline, you can see the trampoline bending around. you. So that curvature of the trampoline would be very similar to the curvature of the universe. But the universe is very, very high in tension. So it doesn't like to bend very much like the trampoline does. Okay. Hmm. 
Oh no. Okay. So here's the thing with these equations. So we're not going to be talking about too many more equations today. I just want to show you a couple. So this was Einstein's great idea that all these things correspond to the curvature of the universe. And this corresponds to how much stuff is in the universe. But here's the problem. You can put different values in each of these things right here, each, in each one of these terms, and you'll get a completely different universe. Not the universe that we live in, a brand new universe. Other universes, multiverses. So somehow we have to work out what these values should be for our universe to try to understand you know, the, the, the birth of our universe, to try to understand the future of the universe, the past of our universe. This is a model of our universe that we can take backwards and forwards in time. So I've got a question right here I'm going to take. What is a multiverse? Oh my goodness. It's a hypothesis theory based on the fact that the universe isn't the only one. It's, in, it's one of the pieces in, in an expansion, maybe like, and a number we can't even say. That's right. So multi means more than one, many. Universe, many universes. So there are some ideas that there are many, many universes out there, but we can only really do science in our universe. So it's very hard to disprove or prove these multi-universe theories. Unless maybe the universes kind of interact with each other. And there's some kind of interaction and we can measure that interaction. So maybe then we can actually talk about multiverses, but in, right now, the science isn't very concrete. Okay, so this is a problem. Einstein described the universe, but we have all these different values we can put in for different universes. So which one is our universe, okay? This is the problem. So how does this progress here? Well, we make a guess. We make a guess what these values are. Well, this one, this one, this one, this one are. But how do we make guesses in science? Yes, right here. Excellent, I like that. So our guesses rely on looking at the data. You might say they rely on evidence, right? Rely on evidence, yes. You get all the things that you know and you use them to make a theory and you will update the theory when there, and you'll probably update the theory if there is new uh, data discovered. And I love that idea. Yes, yes. Wow. I really like that idea. You update the theory when you get new evidence. That's actually something called Bayesian statistics. And um, having an idea of it so early is awesome. Do we have anyone online, Sophia? No? Okay. So please, if you're online, put your questions in the chat or your answers in the chat. And I'll try to um, talk to Sophia and we'll also get those ones. Hop out of there. All right. So we make a justified guess. We're trying to guess what the universe is. That's what we're doing. So some criteria for this guess is that it should not contradict the current evidence. And this evidence is, of course, you know, all the observers looking at the universe, looking around, seeing things. It sh shouldn't contradict anything that we're seeing already. It shouldn't violate any more fundamental physics. And hopefully it's able to be checked through experiment. A good theory is able to be checked through experiment. Okay. And that's exactly what these four men did. Friedman, Lemaitre, Robertson, Walker. So these are three, uh, four, four theoreticians working on this problem. Einstein was like, no, you're never going to solve my equation. But these, these four men did it. No, they did it independently. Yeah. And they made two guesses, two very important guesses. Okay. One that the universe looks the same in all directions. So that means if I'm standing in the middle of the universe and I'm looking around like this, nothing looks really different. Nothing looks kind of strange. It all looks kind of the same this direction as it does this direction, as it does this direction, as it does this direction. Yeah, well, this is the very early universe. And even for the galaxy clusters, it means that when I look down this way, there's a whole bunch of gal galaxy clusters down this line of sight. But if I look this way, there's also galaxy clusters down this line of sight. Kind of yeah, it's kind of true. Or is it? Well, we don't know if it's true. Uh-huh. That's right. That's right. So 
The second guess they made is that the universe looks the same from any different position. So if I was looking in the universe standing over here, it looks the same if I look around or standing over here, wait, 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 over here in the universe, it looks the same as well. So these two guesses, okay? These two guesses actually led to a solution to Einstein's equations. This is what the solution kind of looks like. I'm at least showing you one equation. There's actually two equations. And this kind of says that the expansion rate of the universe is equal to the stuff inside the universe. And that stuff is like the mass, the radiation. So this is like planets, stars, the radiation from the stars, the photons, galaxies. This term is the curvature of the universe. So we know about curvature and how the universe is curved. And this stuff is, is something called dark energy, which we actually won't be talking about today very much. So I have some questions here. Let's go all the way over here in the universe. Yes. So I think the universe keeps going far, far away. And the end of the universe is orange is red. Orange is red. Is yeah. the end of the universe. That's a very interesting hypothesis. Um, interesting, interesting. So the end of the universe is orange is red. Okay. Um, I don't quite know how to interpret that, but I like it. Um, yes, let's let's do one, one more, one more question right here. Oh, okay. Um, or just a comment. I'm pretty sure they've managed to prove that uh, dark energy exists with the large hadron collider. Yep. Okay, so we, we, we've, um, we've had two comments, one about dark energy and one about the end of the universe. Very interesting. I like how everyone is coming up with their own theoretical models. Very exciting stuff. So, so this, is kind of, this is kind of one of the solutions, okay? This looks like a bunch of weird numbers and stuff, but I'm just telling you that this is the expansion rate of the universe is equal to the stuff inside it the curvature, and this thing called dark energy. Yes, it is Greek. Mathematicians, physicists love using Greek. So when you actually plot the, that solution that I just showed you, you just plot it. Here, I'm moving forward in time, and this is kind of a, a slice through the universe, okay? The universe has how many dimensions? Four. Four, that's right. Exactly. So it has three spatial dimensions, X, Y, Z. So X, Y, Z, like where I am in this room in position, then it has one more, which is time. So where I am in time. So right now I'm 221 in time. But right now I'm 221 and a couple of seconds and more and more and more. So I'm moving through the universe in this kind of time worm. This worm of time is moving everywhere in the room, almost at the same speed too. So if I wind those equations backwards in time, so this is forwards in time here. If I wind them backwards in time going this way, you can see that the universe is like contracting. It contracts down into some kind of singularity. Yeah? Does everyone understand what they're seeing? This is kind of the universe like kind of expanding out in this kind of big cylinder thing. But if I move instead of forwards in time, going like this with my cylinder, I go backwards in time, zoop, suddenly it goes zoop at the end. Yes. Yeah, it looks like a bit of a hamster cage because it's like very wiry. That's Okay, one, one, I'm going to have one question over here, one comment. Yes, yes. Oh, what's outside of that? Well, well the thing is, just as I, as I said, this is a two-dimensional or three-dimensional slice of the universe. But the universe is really a 4D thing. So it actually occupies everywhere. We're just slicing it and looking at it from the outside. So it's kind of artificial, but there's nothing kind of outside of the universe as far as we can tell. This is the whole idea of multiverses and so on. These are a bit, a bit like philosophy and science kind of mixing together. We, we're not too sure if they're proper scientific ideas yet. All right, let's keep going. Let's keep going. Yeah? So, I told you that when we wind those solutions from um, Einstein's equations backwards in time, we get a kind of universe that seems like it started off at a very small point and then it went Woof. So what is happening here? What is this point? And I'm going to, yeah, so where should I go? Someone who has it, yes, over here. What do you think that point is? 
Big Bang? That's right. That's the Big Bang. So we got there. Oh my goodness, what's happened here? We have traffic. Okay, I'm going around here. Okay. So we got there. We just had to try to solve Einstein's equations, making the assumptions that the universe looked the same in all directions that we looked at. And also, no matter where we were in the universe, we get this kind of solution. Okay? And this is indeed the Big Bang. So, this other, there's this other period, right? There's this kind of thing that just kind of into, into um, it's very hard for the online people, but let me. So, there's, there's this kind of thing right here. Can you guys see that? No, you guys, okay. This kind of thing right here, this is the Big Bang. But then there's this part where the universe expands really quickly. You see it? And it goes from here to here. Really, really quickly. Yeah. So this is something cosmologists call inflation. Who's heard of inflation before? Anyone? Cool. We have some avid readers out there in cosmology. Very good. So this is crazy. It's very hard to even describe how fast the volume of the universe was changing at this period in time. Very, very hard. But I'm trying to give you an analogy here. Okay, so who's heard of something called DNA? Yes? That's right, deoxyribonucleic acid. Um, so DNA, where is it? Where's it found? Where's it found? Anyone online speaking to us? No? Okay. Where's it found? I'm going to go back over here. Inside anything that's living, oh, pretty much. That's right. So do we have DNA inside of us? Yes. And how big is DNA? Very, very tiny, isn't it? Very, very tiny. So this is actually five micrometers, five micrometers. And DNA is coiled up in these little packages here, very tightly coiled up. So it's even smaller than micrometers. So very, very, very tiny, okay? No. So who knows of Alpha Centauri? Yeah? Closest star to us, that's right. So it, it's, it's about four light years. It's a little bit more than four light years away. So the universe expanded so fast and so much through that inflation period, it's like taking our DNA and blowing it up to the size larger than the distance between us and Alpha Centauri. So it's like the whole thing exploded in volume, creating like something that was as small as our DNA and enlarging it to the size of um, 10 light years in size. So from DNA to light years in size in 10 to negative 33 seconds. Does that even make sense? Negative 33. No. Negative 33? How many, how many zeros is negative 10 to the negative 33? How many zeros? 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 1. Seconds. That's how fast it took for this structure that was the size of DNA to 10 light years. That's inflation. Way less. Nanoseconds, way less than nanoseconds. Yeah. So that's crazy. That's, that's what was happening at the start of the universe. These things just inflating in size really, really, really quickly. So remember, this, all this idea of the Big Bang and everything, it came about from these two guesses that these fine gentlemen made. One, the universe looked the same in all the directions. And two, the universe looks the same from any different position. Yeah? So what should we do as good scientists? Yeah? So we have these two guesses. What should we do next? Yes. I'm coming. Wait, 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 wait. 
prove them wrong. Prove them wrong. Oh, that's an excellent idea. Um, proving them wrong. Yes, that's what I meant. Um, we should actually just test them, right? Maybe they're wrong. Maybe they're right. Exactly. Yeah, we, we should test them. Okay. So that's exactly what we're doing. We must check. How do we check this? Well, we should, make, we should try to make a prediction from this theory. Okay, so, so we want to make a measurement. Just as I was saying earlier on, as scientists, we want to measure things, and this is how we kind of check the things, right? We measure things very carefully, we check the things. So if this idea about the Big Bang is right, then there should be a bunch of light coming from the Big Bang, okay? Yeah? Bunch of radiation and light. This thing was very hot, exploding, radiation everywhere. We should be able to see it when we look in a, with our telescopes way, way backwards in time. We should be able to kind of see this big kind of explosion event. But the thing is, as that light gets to us, so it gets to our cameras, gets to our telescopes, you can kind of see what's happening. It's kind of, as it moves along the universe's space time, it kind of stretches out, it elongates. And that's because the universe is expanding. It elongates the light as it expands. That's right. Exactly right. So we can ask the question, all right, how much should this light have expanded if there was a Big Bang? And the Big Bang model predicts that these should be microwaves. So a microwave is, is a piece of light, a type of light, that is anywhere between a millimeter and a meter. So it kind of, you know, millim so it's got like a wavelength from there to you know, about there. Yeah. Okay. So we should be able to detect these microwaves with our telescopes. And that's exactly what we did. Here you see this beautiful large horn. This is the Pieces and Wilson telescope. And when, when we use this large horn based on, you know, sitting on the earth and we look for microwaves, we kind of see this picture here. It's not entirely obvious what's going on here. So in 1992, we sent a satellite onto uh, going around the earth called COBE. And it was detecting microwaves. It was detecting microwaves as well. And we started seeing this beautiful structure. So this beautiful structure, exactly the kind of microwaves that would be predicted from the Big Bang. But we weren't happy enough as scientists with this image. So in 2003, we sent another um, satellite called WMAP. Yeah. And you can see that we're increasing in resolution. So we're increasing in resolution as we move to more and more sophisticated devices. Oh my goodness. What I almost tripped over. Oh my God. And then in 2013, so quite recently, we sent this guy up. This guy's name is Planck. Yeah. After the, uh, after the theoretician Planck. Do the people know Planck? And, and you can see the resolution has increased again. So this is just the the resolution, the structure of these microwaves that originated way back here, before the stars, before the galaxies, before essentially anything was happening in the universe, there was just this glow from the Big Bang. And this is what Planck is looking at. Planck is looking over here. It's just tracking this glow backwards in time. Yeah, because heat, temperature, is just a measure of the kinetic energy. So a measure of the amount of jiggling. So things jiggled a lot in the early Big Bang. So things were very hot. But you're right, they didn't make any noise. Yes. So if you're an ISO right now and you suddenly just went through all of that, will you carry on under your coat? Oh, so if you try to travel backwards in time. Is that what you mean? Hmm. No, you couldn't really do that. You can only travel forwards in time, unfortunately. Yeah, so, so remember, it, it, remember, we're not actually traveling. So we're not sending the satellite backwards in time. Is that these photons are coming from the Big Bang and interacting with our satellite in the present day. So we're not, tra we're not doing any space, uh, any time travel per se. So yeah. Yeah, it'd be nice to do some time travel. You're time traveling right now. One second per second. So this is what the satellite showed us. This, this, this is the temperature fluctuations of the Big Bang explosion. Viewed after X amount of billions of years in the future. 
means some amount of years in the future, some amount of billions of years in the future. So, so what, what we are expecting here is that no matter where we stand and look around, things should be kind of more or less the same. And no matter how I look around where I'm standing, things should look the same. So no matter where is my position on this map, things should be roughly the same. And no matter what angle I look at things, they should be roughly the same. So those were the assumptions, remember, that came into solving Einstein's equations. And indeed, they end up being pretty much true. So the universe does look the same in all directions based on these very high resolution microwave background maps. And the universe looks the same from any position, more or less, both of these statements are true. So we checked our assumptions about the Big Bang model. Seems like everything is looking really good. So remember what we did based on the processes that happened over here. So this is some predictions from particle physicists and things like this, all these processes. We expect microwaves to be coming out of this Big Bang model. We measure those microwaves over here with these kind of satellites, WMAP, Planck satellites. And we measure the amount of stretching that these waves have done. And it looks very, very good. From that stretching, from the stretching of the waves and those processes, we can actually measure the age of the universe. 13.7. Who knows the next number? No. Who knows the next number? Oh, that's not what I'm looking for. Who knows? Seven. Yes, I'm looking. That was the next number I was looking for. It's good to have some parents input. Seven. Thirteen point seven seven. Who knows the next number? Seven. Seven, seven. No. No. Zero. Next number? Not zero. Eight. Not five. Eight. Three. Two. Oh. Billion years old. Oh, good. Yeah. So just measuring the properties of the light as it's expanded through the universe from the very early Big Bang era to now, we can measure the age of the universe. And it seems like it's 13.772 plus or minus 0 0.040 billion years old. This is a ha two hands up. Whoa. Okay, I better go over here. This is getting serious. We're going to have feet up pretty soon. Um, so the Earth is 4 billion years old. That's which right is actually quite old if compared to the universe. That's right, Because yeah. the Earth's only actually about a third of the universe's age, so... Yeah, it is roughly a third. It's actually really old. Yeah, that's a, that's a really excellent point. So the Earth was around for quite a while. All right. So what's, what's so important? Okay, what's so important about this measurement? Something is important about this measurement, this number that I've shown you. Guys, shh, shh, shh. wait. Shh, shh. Something is very important about this measurement. Yes. True, yes. Yeah, so it could constrain some kind of models about the age of the universe. But I, I'm more talking about this number that I'm showing you on the actual display here. Something's very important about this number. What have I showed you? Not only just the age, but something else. Yes, <laughs> hands and feet. <laughs> um, so we can actually use satellites to look back at 13.772 uh, plus or minus so a billion. I like the last part. So the last part was the plus or minus. In science, in science, when we make measurements, we also, also quantify the uncertainty of those measurements. This is very, very important for doing science. Every measurement we make, we also quantify our uncertainty. Okay, so science is useless if you just, if you just show absolute numbers because this is the thing that tells us, okay, how precise were we with our measurement? How, how well do these satellites actually measure this stretching? This is what that captures. This is our uncertainty. This is just as important science as this number over here. If this was 13.77 plus or minus 20 billion years old, useless. This number is useless. But no, it's good. Okay. 
So I'm almost finished now with the talk, but I want to ask everyone a question. Where do you think this pattern? So remember, these are temperature fluctuations from the very early universe. Where does this pattern come from? I'm going to go to someone who hasn't had over there. Yes. Where do you think this pattern comes from? I had it in my mind, but I forgot. Oh, okay. So, uh, uh, any any ideas at all? I mean, the, the the reality ends up being crazy where this pattern comes from. Yes, where do you think? So, God's the one like the earth. God. God? <laughs> well, if God was the Big Bang, yeah, I would agree. God's the big oh. Bang. Um, so, where do you think this pattern came, comes from? Where do you think this pattern comes from? Any ideas? Yeah? Do you have an idea? No? Where does this pattern come from? Who's got some ideas? We have some down the front now. Where does this pattern come from? Maybe it's because it's like when it started out, it started very small, but then because Ooh. and very dense yes. and, and very hot. Yes. So, and so, and very radioactive. And so when it was, and so in those, in so in those right, very, ten more seconds and I'm in those very tiny yeah, little milliseconds, yes. they it like had solar flares. Solar flares. Okay, interesting. There were no stars around, FYI. Okay, over here. I'm going over here. The Big Bang. Oh yes, this pattern definitely came from the Big Bang. Um, but but how? What was Einstein's equation. Einstein's equation. We'll do one more, one more, and then I'm going to uh, tell you the truth. Um, I think it's the measurements of heat from the Big Bang. It is. That is what this is. Where does the pattern come from? And it ends up being pretty crazy. So I told you that at the very beginning, the universe was very, very small. Very, very small. So, so small that the way that we had to describe the universe was purely through quantum mechanics. So quantum mechanics is, is kind of like this weird area where there's all this fuzziness. Things aren't exactly traveling in straight lines. They're kind of traveling everywhere at the same time. And there are these quantum fluctuations. So these fluctuations from very small particles coming in and out of existence. Yeah. And this is kind of what, what they look like, these weird fluctuations. So when the universe was very small, it was just governed by all these little quantum fluctuations by the smallest things in the universe. And as it inflated very quickly, they imprinted themselves on the, on the microwave background. So these quantum fluctuations from the very smallest part, the smallest parts of the universe, the smallest physics that we, or the physics that we know governs the smallest parts, expanded and blew out across the entire night sky. So expand to light years across for these fluctuations. And then it was through these fluctuations that the largest scale structures in the universe could actually form. So the universe formed this big web of structures, filamentary structures. And then inside these filamentary structures started forming galaxies and stars. So the quantum mechanics of the very smallest things imprinted themselves on the largest structures and where everything would be later on in the universe. So this ends up being a very, very beautiful result. Crazy, right? Everyone's blown away. Alrighty, so that brings us to the end. And also um, we have an excellent speaker coming. Oh, I, I didn't put um, Katie's name on here, but we have an excellent speaker coming to young stars next time, who's going to talk about galaxy formation, stars, and, and the Earth. So pretty much picking up exactly where I left off. Remember, we, we just talked about how the universe started off with these quantum fluctuations. It expanded and grew across the entire sky. We saw these with these microwave backgrounds. And these were the seeds for the largest scale structures in the universe, which then ended up collapsing under gravity, forming galaxies, forming stars. And this is what Katie's going to talk about next week. So I'll just leave it there, I think. And I guess actually we'll be taking questions from online and in the audience.